So I'll be talking about collision resistant uh, trace and revoke for arbitrary identities from standard assumptions. So this is joint work with uh, David Wu. I'll be talking about trace and revoke schemes in this talk. So let me start by defining and motivating the concept. So let's begin with a simple shared key decryption system and motivate trace and revoke from here. So uh, in a setting, we have a group of users in the system, uh, let's say a set of employees in a company, and we want a way to be able to encrypt messages to everyone in the group. Well, we can do this very simply by generating a public key for the group and then providing everyone with the corresponding decryption key for the public key. And so whenever someone wants to broadcast out a message to the group, uh, it can encrypt the message under this uh, single public key and broadcast it out uh, to, through the network. Then since everyone in the group holds the shared decryption key, uh, everyone can decrypt the ciphertext and recover the message. So this uh, simple scenario is all nice and fine, and the system is secure under the assumption that the shared key is managed properly by uh, everyone in the system. Okay, but now let's consider the scenario where this assumption does not hold and the key is actually not managed correctly. So uh, let's suppose that there is actually a malicious uh, member in the group that leaks the shared key uh, to the open internet. Uh, so if this happens, then since the shared key is out in the public, we cannot have uh, any type of security uh, in the system. So if this happens, then from the perspective of the company, uh, it will want to be able to identify who the employee was that leaked the shared key. Uh, so it will want to be able to you know, trace, and, uh, trace the trader so that it can punish the trader and prevent this from happening again in the future. Uh, but in this simple shared key system, uh, since everyone holds the same single shared key, uh, there's no way to tell you know, who was the one who actually um, leaked the key. So this is actually where uh, trader tracing comes in. So, um, so this is an old concept that was introduced by uh, Chor et al. in 1994. So in a trader tracing scheme, uh, everyone in the group holds a key of its own. And the scheme still guarantees broadcast functionality as before, in that if we encrypt um, under a single public key, then everyone in the system can use its own decryption key to decrypt the ciphertext and recover the message. But when a malicious member leaks a key to the outside, then there is a tracing mechanism that when given access to what was leaked, can cor uh, correctly point to the trader that leaked its key. So this is basically uh, the idea of trader tracing. So what makes constructing a trader tracing scheme a highly non-trivial uh, is the way that uh, we model this leakage of key. So we usually model the malicious member leaking the key as creating uh, uh, some sort of a decoder box. So intuitively, we can think of a decoder box as some decryption software that has like the malicious member's decryption key embedded inside it. Uh, and this software can be in any form and it can be like highly obfuscated. So we need uh, to design a tracing algorithm that can interact with this decoder box in a black box way and then identify the trader. So this is kind of what makes trader tracing a difficult problem in general. Okay, finally, a trace and revoke scheme uh, is a concept that was introduced by Nahor and Pincus. Uh, as a further extension of trader tracing. So let's say the company was able to identify that um, Bob was the one who betrayed the group and created uh, the decoder box. Then, can, then is there a way for the company to revoke Bob's access to future ciphertext without going through a complicated key rotation procedure? Well, trace and revoke scheme allows us to do this. So in a trace and revoke scheme, the encryption algorithm additionally takes in a blacklist uh, of users or what is called a revocation list. And so let's say um, that the resulting ciphertext is broadcasted out to everyone in the system. Uh, then everyone who is uh, not in the revocation list can decrypt the ciphertext. Uh, everyone who is included in the revocation list um, cannot decrypt the ciphertext. So this is the concept of a trace and revoke scheme. So there are a number of ideal properties that we may want from a trace and revoke scheme. So the first is collusion resistance. So suppose that we have multiple parties in the group that are malicious and are colluding with each other. So let's, let's say Bob and Charlie come together, uses both of their two keys and create a decoder box. Then we still want our tracing algorithm to take this decoder box and be able to identify at least one of the malicious members of the group. So the second property uh, is unbounded revocation. So in some existing revocation schemes, uh, the setup algorithm uh, must specify a bound on the size of the revocation list. So in these schemes that like, we have to specify that we're going to you know, revoke at most like 10 users in the system or 30 users in the system, and we have to specify this at setup. So ideally um, in a revocation scheme, we would like to be able to support an unbounded size of our revocation list. And uh, the next is uh, black box tracing. So like I mentioned before, the decoder that a malicious member generates 
may be in any form and can be obfuscated. So we, we want our tracing algorithm to be able to work only given the input and output uh, behavior of the decoder box. And finally, um, another property that we may want from a, a trace and revoke scheme is the ability to support a mounted number of users. Um, so in many existing uh, schemes, to, to generate the keys for each user, we have to run a single setup algorithm that takes in a, bounded, uh, a bound on the total number of users in the system. So after this setup, you know, no user can additionally join the system. So it would be nice if the scheme is uh, identity based uh, in that any new user can go to like a key generating authority and receive a decryption key corresponding to their identity. Uh, this way, an unbounded number of users can uh, join the system. All right. So our goal in this work was to achieve a tracing revoke scheme that achieved all of these ideal properties uh, while relying only on uh, standard assumptions. So if we look at uh, the existing trace and revoke uh, literature, uh, there has been a lot of beautiful papers with uh, very elegant ideas, uh, some of these which I am uh, listing here. Uh, but none of these constructions actually address all of the properties that I listed uh, in the previous slide. So there are constructions that only support security against like boundary collusions, uh, which means that security is guaranteed only when at most a pre-specified number of users come together to generate a decoder. Uh, some of the constructions are, are not identity based, so it can only support a polling number of users. Um, there are also constructions that achieve, uh, I guess, all of the properties um, that we want uh, from the previous slide, but it relies on strong assumptions like Windows encryption or uh, indistinguishability obfuscation. So uh, in this work, uh, we construct a new trace and revoke scheme. So our construction satisfies all of the properties uh, that I listed out previously. So it is uh, fully collision resistant, uh, it is identity based, it can revoke an amount of number of users, and we only rely on the hardness of LWE for our, our security. And so for trace and revoke schemes, ciphertext size is an important metric that we generally have to consider. So for our scheme, the size of the ciphertext does depend uh, linearly in the size of the revoke set, but the size grows logarithmically uh, with the, the number of bits needed to represent each identity of users. So I can discuss more about the ciphertext size uh, later on in this talk. All right, so for the remainder of the time that I have, uh, let me give a high-level overview of our construction. So most of the existing constructions on trader tracing and trade and revoke schemes uh, in the literature follow a general paradigm of constructing uh, or using what is called a private linear broadcast encryption, or PLB for short. So this is a concept uh, that was first introduced by Bonet et al. in 2006, and it serves as a natural stepping stone um, to constructing a, a tracing scheme. So uh, we also just follow this paradigm, and since most of the intuition for constructing a trade, trade tracing scheme uh, or trace and revoke is embedded inside this concept, uh, let me give uh, th this concept, let me describe uh, this concept in a, a little bit more detail. So the syntax uh, might look a little bit odd um, if you are uh, if you have never seen this before. Uh, if you're familiar with attribute based encryption, then the syntax uh, will be a little bit more familiar. So uh, a PLB scheme is, first of all, an encryption scheme. So there is going to be a setup algorithm, an encryption algorithm, and a decryption algorithm. So the setup algorithm is going to generate a set of uh, public keys uh, or public parameter, um, a tracing key, and a set of decryption keys. So intuitively, uh, we can imagine like a setup algorithm being run uh, once, and uh, the public parameters are public. The tracing key uh, is provided to some tracing authority. And each decryption key is to be distributed to um, everyone in the system. Okay. Right. Then uh, the encryption algorithm, uh, which I will denote by uh, PP encrypt for this talk, um, takes in the public parameters and a message, and it spits out a ciphertext, which I will denote by CT0 uh, for uh, reasons that will be clear in a minute. Um, and then the decryption algorithm um, is a natural one uh, that takes in a decryption key, a ciphertext, and produces a, a message in the end. Okay, so now what is special about uh, a PLB scheme is that there is another way of generating a ciphertext. Um, so this is what I am going to call uh, the TK encrypt, uh, which takes in a tracing key uh, and index I and a message uh, M and produces a ciphertext, uh, CT sub I. Uh, so the PP encrypt is basically a public uh, encryption algorithm that uh, only re that requires the public parameters uh, to generate the ciphertext. So the TK encrypt is basically um, a private key um, encryption algorithm that requires the tracing key to actually generate the ciphertext. So the correctness condition for a PLB scheme uh, guarantees that uh, a decryption key, uh, SK sub i, can decrypt any ciphertext, uh, CT sub j, for j uh, less than or equal to i. 
So any decryption key, SKI, um, can decrypt any ciphertext that were generated via either the, the public encryption algorithm or the, the, the private uh, key encryption algorithm for indices um, that is less than or equal to um, I. Uh, so for security, uh, we require that a PLB scheme satisfies uh, three security properties. So these security properties might uh, be a little bit weird at first, but when I discuss how we construct a tracing scheme from PLB in the next slide, uh, it will become a little bit more clear. All right, so the first property uh, that a PLB scheme should uh, satisfy is what is called a normal hiding. So this property says that a ciphertext that is generated via the public key, uh, for the public encryption algorithm is computationally indistinguishable from, uh, 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 from a ciphertext that is generated uh, via the private key encryption algorithm under the index uh, one. So remember that our correctness condition guarantees that SK sub I uh, can decrypt all ciphertext that is in, um, encrypted under the index J um, that is less than or equal to I. So, and the decryption, the decryption keys that are generated from uh, the setup algorithm ranges from uh, 1 to n. So, these two ciphertexts that were generated via the, the two um, encryption algorithms are basically, um, can be decrypted by anyone uh, in the system. And we're requiring that these two ciphertexts um, are computationally indistinguishable. And next, a PLB scheme should satisfy our index hiding, which says that without a decryption key, SK sub j, uh, it is computationally infeasible to distinguish a ciphertext that is encrypted under the index J and a ciphertext that is uh, encrypted under the index J plus 1. So the correctness condition guarantees that if a user only has access to a decryption key that is under an index that is not equal to J, then you can either, then you can either decrypt both of these ciphertexts or not, able to, or not be able to decrypt uh, both ciphertexts. So the index hiding requirement guarantees that without a decryption key for index J, uh, one cannot distinguish between these two ciphertexts. And finally, um, a PLB scheme should satisfy message hiding, uh, which is analogous requirement for standard semantic security. Uh, this says that without a decryption key for an index i that is greater than or equal to um, index j, the ciphertexts that are generated under index j is uh, semantically secure. All right, so let me describe how we go about constructing a trader tracing scheme uh, from a secure a PLB scheme. So well, the setup algorithm is going to be run in the beginning, as I described before. So the tracing key is going to be provided to some tracing authority, and the description keys are going to be distributed to each user in the system. Then for general uh, encryption, we would just use the public encryption algorithm. So by the correctness condition uh, of the PLB scheme, everyone in the system can decrypt the ciphertext and recover the message. Right? Uh, now, suppose that a user in the system creates a decoder box. So in this example, say Charlie uh, creates a decoder box and uh, he, he has uh, index three, he's uh, associated with index three. So let's say the decoder box has uh, Charlie's key, SK sub three uh, inside it, and the box can decrypt, and decrypt any ciphertext that is encrypted under the public encryption algorithm. So how would the tracing authority trace uh, Charlie, trace the trader? Well, the tracing authority is going to first use the private encryption algorithm to generate a ciphertext under the index one. So let's say, <clears throat> so let's call this ciphertext ET1. The authority uh, will basically just test um, whether the decoder box can decrypt the ciphertext ET1 or not. So by the normal hiding uh, security property, the decoder should not be able to distinguish between a publicly encrypted ciphertext and a privately encrypted ciphertext. So the decoder sh a box should still be able to decrypt the ciphertext under index one, uh, given that it can, uh, it can decrypt uh, any ciphertext uh, that is encrypted under the public encryption algorithm. All right. Uh, next, the tracing authority would then try um, try index two. So it will uh, run the private encryption algorithm with index two to generate CT two. Uh, then it will test whether the quarter box can still correctly decrypt uh, CT two. So uh, by the index hiding property, uh, the decoder box should not be able to distinguish between CT1 and CT2. Remember, the, the index hiding property guarantees that to distinguish between CT1 and CT2, uh, one needs a decryption key, uh, SK1, which means that only Alice can uh, distinguish between these two ciphertexts. So the decoder box uh, that was created by Charlie cannot distinguish between CT1 and CT2, so it should, it, so it should correctly decrypt uh, CT2. Right, and the tracing of uh, so the trader author, the tracing authority continues this process. Um, so it uh, generates a ciphertext CT3 and tests whether the decoder works on the ciphertext or not. Then it will also generate CT4 and test whether the decoder uh, works or not on the ciphertext. Uh, now, by the message hiding uh, security, the decoder box that only has the, the decryption key SK3 uh, inside it uh, should not be able to decrypt ciphertext CT4. 
And this is because the index associated with SK3 is less than uh, the index associated with CT4. Right? Remember that message hiding security guarantees that a key SK sub i can only decrypt ciphertext SK sub j, for which j is like less than or equal to i. So uh, this, this decoder box will uh, be able to correctly decrypt uh, CT3, but not CT4. So after testing out all of these ciphertexts on uh, the decoder box, the tracing algorithm can deduce that uh, Charlie was actually the one who created the decoder box. Of course, this is a, a huge simplification, but this is uh, really like the main intuition behind, uh, tra behind trader tracing um, from PLB. All right, so we know that a PLB scheme gives rise to a trader tracing scheme. So what do we currently know about uh, PLB constructions uh, in the literature? Uh, well, there are a couple of constructions, uh, and from LWE, there is a beautiful construction that is due to Goel et al. from 2018. So uh, we can use Goel et al. construction to achieve a regular trade tracing scheme that can support a polynomial number of identities. So our goal in this work was to construct an identity-based trace and revoke scheme. So we had to basically solve uh, two problems. Um, so the first was on constructing a trader tracing scheme that allows us to trace uh, traders from uh, an exponential pool of users uh, in order to make it identity-based. And the second was on adding a revocation functionality on top of this uh, resulting trader tracing scheme. The first problem was relatively straightforward to overcome. So the starting point is uh, was the work of Goel et al. Uh, from uh, uh, 2018, so which gives a PLB scheme from LWE that, ports, that supports a polynomial number of uh, users. But if you look at their construction, then algebraically speaking, uh, we can actually embed an exponential number of user information uh, in the ciphertext. So in order to upgrade um, the GKW construction from a polynomial identity space trader tracing scheme to an exponential identity space scheme, uh, we just needed a tracing mechanism that allows us to trace uh, identities in, a, in an exponential identity space. So if you recall the tracing algorithm that I described on the previous slide, uh, the tracing algorithm tests the decoder box on like CT1, CT2, CT3, and, and so on. So this tracing algorithm uh, works only when we're working with like polynomial identity spaces, um, and it will not run efficiently for exponential identity spaces. So the question is, you know, how do we go about uh, tracing, uh, uh, tracing users from an exponential uh, identity space? And for this, there is actually a very nice work due to Anishimaki et al. from 2018 that gives a very nice tracing algorithm for like exponential identity spaces. <clears throat> so it is uh, basically a recursive uh, version of the tracing algorithm that I described on the previous slide. So if the tracing algorithm from the previous slide is like analogous, uh, analogous to like a linear search, the NWZ tracing algorithm is analogous to like a binary search. Okay, so to construct a trader tracing scheme for exponential identity spaces, um, it seems like we can just combine the techniques from uh, GKW and NWZ, and that is actually uh, exactly what we do. Uh, but we do have to be to do this in like a, a careful way, and in particular, the PLB syntax um, does not actually support the NWZ tracing algorithm. So we basically have to generalize the GKW18 construction from a PLB scheme to what is called a, a general a predicate encryption uh, scheme with some additional properties. So I will go over a predicate encryption in the next slide. And uh, the second problem of adding the revocation functionality to the resulting trader tracing scheme requires a bit more, more work. Um, the main technique that we use is what is called a subset cover set system, uh, which is a specific combinatorial way of encoding user identities uh, so that we can revoke users efficiently. I will talk more about this um, after I discuss the predicate encryption. All right, so let me go over the syntax for our predicate encryption scheme. So I guess uh, much of this space is about the right set of definitions. So the notion of tracing is actually very subtle and it's important to have like the right set of uh, primitives to work with uh, in this space. Uh, so uh, the version of predicate encryption that we use in this work may look a little bit different from the traditional notion of predicate encryption. Uh, we're going to have the traditional predicate encryption algorithms. So the setup, keygen, encrypt, and decrypt. The version that we use in this work is a ciphertext policy predicate encryption. So the policy function is associated with the ciphertext and attributes are associated with the keys. In this work, we use predicate encryption with an additional broadcast functionality. So it has a broadcast uh, algorithm that takes in the public parameters and a message and produces a ciphertext, CT. The correctness condition is basically as follows. For ciphertext that was generated by the standard encryption algorithm, a key SK sub X can decrypt the ciphertext CT sub F if and only if f of x equals to 1. And for ciphertexts that uh, were generated by the broadcast algorithm, any decryption key can decrypt the, the ciphertext. So this is basically almost a direct generalization of a PLBE scheme. So the broadcast algorithm corresponds to the public encryption algorithm of a PLBE scheme. 
The encryption algorithm here corresponds to the private key encryption algorithm in uh, PLB. What is a little bit different here from, uh, from then a PLB scheme uh, is that a setup algorithm uh, generates a master secret key. Uh, then the key generation algorithm takes in the master secret key and produces specific decryption keys for uh, different attributes. So this can support uh, exponential number of identities. So it is important uh, here to note that the broadcast functionality that we use here uh, is different from the strong broadcast functionality in the context of broadcast encryption. So here by broadcast, we just mean a way to like, encrypt so that like any key can decrypt the ciphertext. All right. So uh, and the security requirement, I won't go over it, uh, but it is uh, basically a very straightforward generalization of the security requirements for a PLB scheme. So if we had a, a predicate encryption scheme with these correctness and security requirements, then we can combine it with the tracing algorithm of Nishimaki et al. Um, to construct a trader tracing scheme that can support an exponential number of uh, identities. The question then is um, how we um, go about constructing a predicate encryption scheme uh, with these properties. And I won't be able to give the precise details in this talk, uh, so I will refer to the paper for the details. Uh, but the construction is very similar to the construction of uh, GKW, of the GKW PLB scheme. Uh, we basically just combine attribute-based encryption with what is called misfunctional encryption, uh, as was done in GKW. All right, so in the remaining time that I have, let me just quickly talk about uh, how we achieve revocation. So the main tool that we use to add on the public revocation uh, property to our priority code encryption is uh, what is called a subset cover system, which was first defined by Anaur et al. Um, so I can define what subset cover system is formally, but I think an example will uh, make things a lot more clear. So let me just uh, go straight to an example. So I think about this as uh, a reverse Merkle tree. So imagine we have like a Merkle tree structure. So the root is associated with an empty string. Uh, and the leaf nodes are associated with a string that is determined by its path uh, from the root. So if L is the height of the tree, then each leaf node uh, is going to be associated with a string of length L. So we can construct a simple revocation scheme uh, just using this combinatorial structure. So right now, let's not care about tracing and let's just think about uh, constructing a simple revocation scheme. So uh, in a revocation scheme, uh, each user is going to be associated with a leaf in the tree. So in this example, we have like a Merkle tree of height three, and so we're going to have uh, eight number of users. Um, then we're going to associate a, a public key to each node in the tree. Um, so we're going to have a public key uh, for the root, uh, a public key for the node uh, zero, for the node one, and so on. So we're gonna associate a public key for each node in the tree. And then we're going to distribute the decryption keys to the users. Um, so that each user will have a decryption key associated with its leaf node and the nodes of its path to the root. So for instance, uh, user zero uh, will hold um, a decryption key associated with the node 000, 00, 00, 00, 0 and the root. And uh, the user 100 zero, zero will hold a decryption key for um, 100, zero, zero, 101 and, and, and the root. Okay. So that is how we will distribute the keys. Uh, now let's say we want to encrypt the message to everyone in the system. Uh, then what we can do is just encrypt the message under uh, the root public key. Uh, since everyone has a decryption key for uh, the root public key, everyone can decrypt uh, such ciphertext. Now consider we want to like revoke a user. So, we want, so say we want to revoke a user uh, 010. Um, so we want to encrypt the message to everyone in the system except for the user uh, 010. Well, then using the Merkle tree property, we can identify a linear number of subtrees that covers all, of, all the leaf nodes except for the user uh, 010. So uh, we can then encrypt the message uh, under all the public keys associated with the root of uh, each of these uh, subtrees. Uh, this property guarantees that even if we have multiple users uh, that we want to revoke, say n number of users that we want to revoke, there will always be a most O of n number of subtrees that we can identify and encrypt to. So we use this uh, structure to construct a revocable predicate encryption scheme. So uh, instead of a public key for a regular encryption scheme, uh, we use the public parameters for a predicate encryption scheme and associate each of these uh, with um, each node in the tree. So, um, so this is basically the main idea uh, that we use. I guess one problem with this though is that if there are an exponential number of users in the system, then we need an exponential number of public parameter components in the system because there are exponential number of uh, leaf 
or, or of nodes uh, in the entire tree. So we get around this uh, problem um, by modifying our predicate encryption construction so that uh, it has reusable compact public parameters. So we use the property that the public parameters and uh, the master secret keys uh, in uh, existing uh, mixed FE constructions um, can be generated like separately, um, independently. So this allows um, our encryption algorithm uh, in the predicate encryption construction to generate the mixed FE parameters on the fly. So um, I will refer to the paper for the exact details on how uh, we do this, uh, how we exactly we do this. Um, and that's basically it. Um, it. This is um, basically the high level idea. Uh, we combine like ABE with a mixed FE to construct a predicate encryption scheme. And then we use the subset cover system to do the revocation. The subset cover system that we actually use in the paper is a bit more complicated than the system that I described in the previous slide. Uh, we do this for better efficiency. So for a smaller ciphertext size. All right, so let me just quickly um, describe some open problems. Um, so in infrastructure, we need a tracing key to trace decoders. And uh, this tracing key has to be kept private from the users in the system. So a nice open problem in this area is to actually get public tracing, where the tracing key can be just out in the public and anybody can uh, trace decoders. Uh, and next is to achieve succinct ciphertext. So the size of the ciphertext in our system grows uh, linearly with the, the number of users uh, in the revocation set. Uh, it would be nice to get this down to um, sublinear. And finally, for security, we rely on the sub-exponential harness of LWE. Uh, it would be nice to get the same result that relies only on the polynomial harness of LWE. All right, that's it. Thank you.